So we're going to talk about design principles, uh, also known as the minimum you need to know as a developer about design. So first, uh, some references. This book is really good. Uh, in fact, um, many of the design principles I'm talking about come from this book. This is another good book uh, that I found for web design. Uh, there's a bunch of websites that will give you design patterns. These are similar to uh, design patterns in software engineering, but for design. And uh, you can follow these links to them. They, they'll they give you ideas about how to do, uh, you know, cover flow or, uh, you know, how to do pickers, choosers, etc. How to lay out uh, when you have a specific problem, how to solve it using you know, user interface design elements. So, uh, just in general, uh, most developers think that design is this abstract thing that is very hard, sort of a soft thing that you know there has no rules. Uh, actually, the opposite is true. Design has a lot of rules, just like programming, and really, it is very similar. There are a lot of rules that you must obey. You know, most of the time. Not all the time, but most of the time, and if you don't obey them, then you really, really need to know what you're doing, which you don't as a programmer. Uh, so basically, you should learn all these rules that we're talking about and apply them whenever they're fit, they're necessary. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is color. Uh, first thing is to use few colors. Just in general, I find that developers, you know, programmers, in class, just tend to do stuff like this, just awful. Just to don't, you don't think about colors and then you just pick a new color for each new thing you're doing. Uh, don't do that. And use a palette. So you want to use a palette for your application, whether it's web or desktop, whatever. Uh, a palette is a set of colors. And uh, when you're writing your program, generally you're going, you're not going to obviously hard code the colors. You're going to have some, you know, public static file or some other global variables that hold the color in different systems. You know, Android, iOS, they deal with this in different ways, but it's always the same idea. You have uh, a simple way of saying the background color is this, the foreground color is that, the accent color is that, and then if you want to change it, you, you change it. And which you will change it a bunch of times, uh, but you, to change it, you just have to go to this one place and it'll change it everywhere. Um, so keep the color palette separate. Okay, so to pick a color, again, this is one of the things that seem magical for design for programmers. They look at designers and they pick the colors, but it turns out it's a very simple thing tool for picking colors is called the color wheel and uh, this is the the color scheme designer website uh at this url here uh but uh color wheel looks you know kind of like this and uh you can pick colors and in this case the website you can click on it and uh it'll give you the various shades of that color uh, but then the color wheel if you pick uh, any color in the wheel the color opposite uh, that color is is a good color. It's a good color pair. So that's uh, those are they call complementary colors. So you can use those. Uh, also, uh, oh, you can form a triad, an equilateral triangle. If you pick those colors there, those also go well. So no matter what color you pick, you know any three colors as long as they are on this triangle in the color wheel will work. Uh, similarly, there's also the, the Tetrad, uh, which is a little bit different. Uh, and uh, this other one, this website has the Analogic and so forth, uh, the accented one. So um, the uh, the opposite color is uh, generally is a good accent color, right? So if you're doing something in red, in this case, this green here will be a good accent color to have. And uh, so I'm not making this up. I mean, people, if you go to almost any website, you will find that they're using colors from a color palette. And you can pretty easily figure it out whether it's, you know, the, the dual or the triad or the quad. Uh, here, this is Apple, right? They're using this blue here. You look up this blue here and opposite is, opposite it is this orange here. And you can see that their accent color here in my card and search is is 
orange. So they're using that, something like that. Uh, here is a mint app and uh, they're using uh, these kind, these colors here uh, for their greens and reds and yellows. So uh, you can also, even easier, you, there's websites that, that give you palettes. Color Lovers is one of them. There's a bunch, there's several of these websites that collect color palettes. They're nice because you can search for them. You know, if you're looking for science, what's the color of science? Uh, you can search for that and you can search for Mother's Love or, or whatever. So you can do a little text search, sort of get the feeling, but these are curated sets of colors. They're awesome. There's color associations that uh, these are culture dependent, right? So, but our, our culture here in the U.S. has certain associations with yellow cabs and red passion. And blue is relaxing. Orange, it gives you a boost. Uh, and green is either nature or hacking, depending on whether it's a background, it's black or not. Uh, black is luxury, black tuxedos, black limo, and white is relaxing. Uh, purple is royal, well, at least in the, it is in the UK, in the US, uh, not, maybe not so much. Um, the 80-20 rule, 80% uh, of the time your users will use the same 20% of the features, so you want to optimize for those. So this is the kind of thing that uh, the, you know, the ribbon here in Microsoft Word was trying to do, right? So they try to pick out these are the most used features. So we're going to put those right here in the ribbon and everything else we're going to throw in this menu, which goes on forever uh, because, you know, 20% of the people will need the, the one thing that's over like three menus down. So they still want to put it, but the things that you use the most, those should be easy to get to easy to find in your design. The aesthetic usability effect, this is a research result that tells us that aesthetic designs are perceived as easier to use. Here's TiVo versus uh, Time Warner, Cable, basically the same design, but people, when they use both of these, they'll tell you this one's easier to use, even though, I mean, they're both showing the same thing, right? Uh, this is just more crowded. It's got more boxes, more needless boxes uh shades you know uh, they're not really needed uh where is this it doesn't so anything that looks better looks cleaner people will tell you it's easier to use even if it's not so if you want people to tell you your software is so easy to use make it look good uh, and affordance this is a, a definition uh, but it's a very important uh, in design, we'd say an affordance is a physical characteristic that influences function. So the classic example is this, the door here. When you see, you say on this side, you see this handle here, we can say that this door affords pulling. So basically, you see it, you really want to pull it. There's something about it uh, that your hand just fits right there and you want to pull it. Uh, versus on this side, you have the flat there and then that affords pushing. So obviously you can't pull that flat slab. All you can do with it is push it. So it affords uh, the pushing of it. Uh, Legos are another example of Ford uh, sticking them together. So you just get two of those and you can, you know, you just feel like oh, I want to put these things together. Uh, here back to the door, uh, you can see some examples uh, with this door here where you can uh, pull it from both sides and here's another example of uh, pushing uh, the door so an, a different example of uh, uh, pushing affordance uh, the iPhone right the, these icons here were designed specifically to afford uh, tapping on them right so they're just the right size of human finger and you just see them and you know you want to tap them for whatever reason uh, similarly, you know, in all the affordance in 3D and just, you know, user interface design was this 3D sort of view. It's, you know, if you look at this carefully, you see that it's shaded. So it's darker in the bottom and lighter at the top. It's very subtle, but it's there. It gives it this 3D, you know, that pops up a little bit. And that just makes you want to click it. For whatever reason, we want to click that thing. Because it's a race like that, we just want to pop it, like maybe one of those pop bottle, bottle pop packing material. Um, 
So that's not another affordance. So you've got to be aware of these things. Uh, certain things will have affordances and you want to use them properly. Uh, alignment uh, makes your app cleaner and thus makes the people think that it's better. So most of the user interfaces will help you with this. They'll draw those little vertical lines when you're drawing your GUI. Uh, use them and try to align everything correctly. Again, it's a very simple thing, but so many people don't take the time to just uh, align things. It takes no time at all. Uh, similarly, in, in the web, we have the, the grid systems, the so when you're doing web design, you usually decide whether you're going to go with one column, two columns, or three columns. Uh, and then, you know, with the three columns, you can mix and match. Um, so you can move one whole column here, and then go to three, to one, and then maybe two. So that's just, you notice every single website is a line along these lines. Um, chunking. So when you have a lot of stuff to show, like Amazon, uh, you can try to combine a lot of units into a limited number of chunks, right? So here I have a lot of books, uh, but I'm combining them into sort of this chunk here and then this other chunk here, and then I have this vertical chunk here, you know, the old gigantic menu. Uh, so, but, you know, that helps the user separate, like obviously these things are different from these things here, and which are this is different from this thing over here, which is different from this whole header area here because uh, they all sort of the same right so these things are similar and they're together so they form one big chunk and so when you need to show a lot of things and they might not be different try to make the things that are similar physically similar so they should look the same and distinct from the other things and make these things similar among the among themselves the comma fate is, this is, you know, when you're doing uh, some uh, animations, uh, if you have a bunch of things moving together, they're perceived as related. So whenever uh, birds, you have a flock of birds, they're all moving together, they're all related to each other. Uh, and user interfaces, when we see two planes, and yeah, this is a, you know, a radar, when we see two planes moving together, we kind of tend to assume that they're related in some way, they're flying together. They have something to do with each other because they're moving at the same time or in the same direction. Confirmations, very important. So it's a simple thing to do, but you, when the user is going to delete something, obviously uh, you confirm with them, right? So he hits the delete button. You say, are you sure you want to delete that? Yes or no, right? Are you sure you want to reformat that hard drive? Yes or no? Simple idea, but very important. Uh, constraint. The best way to get your user to not input bad data is to not let them do input bad data. So, you know, text boxes are, are a problem because the user can enter anything in a text box. However, drop down lists and check boxes, uh, he can't. And the user can only check some of them, right? So you're limiting the user to those things. Similarly with these uh, sliders, right? You're limiting them to a value between these two sets. And with the date picker, you're limiting them to an actual date. So providing the user with the right constraint um, makes your design a lot easier and makes you know a lot less um, frustrating for them. So they guess then you know you don't have to tell them no, that's not you didn't enter the right value. I don't understand what you're saying. So I use these control. You in certain programs, uh, many programs have sort of different levels of control right so here is uh, ubuntu uh when you're trying to install the ubuntu it you might set it on to expert mode so there's a easy mode that just asks you a couple of questions and then goes ahead and installs everything and expert mode lets you change everything similarly this is a router uh you have uh you can do a setup 
here in this tab, which is basically what most people do, just the basic setup done. Or you can click over to these other tabs. You see these other tabs are dark, right? They're hard to see. They're sort of blend in the background. And they really don't want you to click on them, right? So only if you are an expert do you notice these things and you go ahead and click them. Subtle, but but there. And similarly over here, this thing, this expert menu was hidden under like F6 or something. Um, so you can hide these things for the expert users. Uh, error types. There's uh, two main types of errors, slips and mistakes uh, that your user might make. So a user might slip, right? So when he presses the wrong button, so uh, he, you know, it's an actual physical problem, uh, especially if you have a sort of a game uh, where you're pressing a bunch of buttons or things are going fast, or just the kind of app that, uh, or mobile app that's just hard to use with the one finger. Um, and uh, there's also a tension slip, uh, which happens a lot now with mobile. Uh, also, just web browsing, people forget that we you know, go to a different tab or they get called out and get an email or whatever. And then they come back and then they forgot where they were. So you have to, uh, at all times, you know, sort of remind the user where they are in uh, the process, right? So you got to focus the attention, you got to give highlights, say this is where you are, this is the thing that needs to get done next. Uh, there's also mistakes, right? So uh, different types of mistakes is when the user perceives something wrong. He sees something wrong, he reads it wrong. Like I might just read this text here incorrectly. Um, there's decision problems when the user makes a uh, bad decision. Uh, so you want to help them in this case, right? So if you make a bad decision, how do you help them recuperate from it? You know, the back button. Uh, and then there's just knowledge. Uh, the user might forget if you have commands or tons of menus, the user might forget where the thing, the menu is, right? So you have to try to find ways of helping the user remember uh, the things that he does, that, that he needs to do, and how to use your program. Uh, Pitt's law. So Pitt's law tells us that the time to move to a target is proportional to the distance to a target and inversely proportional to the target size. So in a web application, if I'm moving to the other side, right, uh, I'm trying to hit the button. If the button is big, I can hit it pretty easily. But if uh, the button is small, it's harder to hit. Um, this this comes this becomes important in you know when you're doing menus. Uh, so you want to you know, put the things again that are used often, make them big or make them close. The flexibility usability trade-off, it's just, you know, this basic trade-off that we're dealing with and that some things are, uh, very flexible. Like this remote here, it's got a lot of functions. I can do tons of stuff, uh, but the Apple remote right here has only a few buttons and so I can't do so many things but it's easy to use and uh, so that's the basic trade-off and uh, you know this is why we use the expert mode sometimes and you might imagine an Apple remote that you know all of a sudden flips open and then reveals like 10,000 buttons like this one uh, that's not the case for the Apple remote because uh, they don't want their users to be experts uh, but you can imagine doing that uh, so, but generally, yeah, you have to deal with this trade-off. Uh, so that's one way of dealing with it. Uh, hiding things under various menus is another way of dealing with it. Forgiveness. So you want to always help people avoid errors and minimize repercussions when they occur, right? So things like undo, uh, the time machine, uh, and, uh, you know, various refactoring, uh, or, you know, code refactoring tools that your, this is your IDE might provide. Um, uh, these are different ways that software helps people undo things. So they will fall on this, this undo idea. So I made, I messed up, uh, how can I go back 
and undo the thing that I did. Again, most developers, you know, really forget about this. <laughs> Uh, because it's hard, you know, you, when you're writing software, you're focusing on just getting the, the feature implemented, right? Uh, so you got the feature implemented, but now, you know, now you have to undo it. Now you have to figure out, well, what if he did it by mistake? How can I undo it? That just seems like this whole other ball of pain, which it is. Uh, but you don't need to do that because your user, you have to be forgiven to your user and your user is going to have a very bad experience without an undo. Uh, the Gutenberg diagram, this is Gutenberg diagram, uh, uh, just follows uh, sort of American uh, Western left to right, top to bottom reading. So the, the way you read, you know, it's like this, left to right, top to bottom. So that means that the primary optical area is up here and the eye, you know, starts up here and then moves in this direction down to here. So if you have a web page, that's what people are going to tend to do. So the most important thing is should be up here and the sort of closing, you know, the buy button should be down here. You'll see this in many websites. This That's exactly where put the, the logo or uh, the catch-all, you know, the important the, the little eye grabber up here. And then down here is the buy button. And these two areas here are, uh, this one is the one they never read. So this is where the help button usually is. Uh, and the log out and log in button because those are the users that already know what they're doing. Have been there a lot, so they know to look for it. And uh, over here is also a fairly weak area. So you don't want to try to put stuff in those areas or put things that uh, the new user doesn't need or just a passerby can ignore. Uh, the Hicks law is, is no, it says that the time to decide is proportional to the number of choices. So the more choices you give somebody, the longer it's going to take them to decide. This can be really an issue. Uh, for example, you know, if you have a game and you ask people to select an avatar and you give them a bunch of them, they might just quit your game and never actually play because they're like, oh, that's going to take forever. Um, in the uh, Nintendo Wii, you know, you have to keep pick your Wii guy, uh, your me, and uh, and that's uh, that can take forever if you're not into it. Maybe you know, people you just give up. Uh, so. Uh, and you can actually, the way they got around it uh, is by letting you just use this one guy uh, that's built in, right? Uh, they just let you pick, they, they pick one for you. So that's one way of getting around it. Just pick something for the user and not let them think. Uh, but it's something to keep in mind that, you know, more choices is not necessarily better. Um, hierarchy. Uh, oddly enough, so we, we love this as developers, we love trees, uh, and turns out users do too. So people have a really intuitive you know, concept of you know nested you know, hierarchies like this one, like your folder hierarchy or a tree hierarchy like this. People really understand that. So this widget, which comes with most apps, uh, is very useful and you can use it. You know, people will understand where things are. The hierarchy of needs, uh, this is just general uh, psychological idea. It says that uh, meet users' needs in the, 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 the user, sort of, sorry, um, the users, people have this hierarchy of needs. And uh, what we want to do is we meet them in the bottom up order. So, first, your program has to work. That's the, the first thing. And really, uh, I think most programs, they, they, they stop there. <laughs> uh, but the second one is once it does what it needs to get done, it should be reliable. It shouldn't crash. So do, do everything that needs to do and not crash. And third is usability. So be easy to use, right? And uh, this one, if you don't get this one, um, you might lose in the marketplace, right? So one, if you have an app that's been sold and there are other apps out there that are easier to use, guess who's going to win? They're going to win. 
right? So they're going to get all the clients, they're going to get all the sales uh, because they're just easier to use. Uh, even sometimes if they don't have as much functionality uh, as you know. Um, but so after that, then proficiency. So uh, people who use the program a lot will uh, kind of require different features. They need to, you know, they need to be fast at it. They need the program to work well for them because they're using it every day so they need things like keyboard shortcuts right or other ways to create shortcuts in your program for their setup uh, so that's the next step and then the, you know the final step is creativity where uh, you allow the user really just creative uh, freedom right so um, the your design is, is, is beautiful and it people feel good about using it your program and it allows them creative freedom to do you know whatever it is that your program does really well uh, highlighting uh, very important so many times you need to call attention to something so you highlight it so you can use uh, bold italic or some strange fonts you can use color you can change the background color there are different ways of doing it you can see some of them are more annoying i'm looking at you background color uh, than others like bold face pretty standard but still works so many times you know the the, the simplest one bold face or italic are uh, the best choices icons uh, your programs will have icons more likely than not and uh, you need again to think carefully about choosing icons there's several different types of icons um, that we can categorize them in so we can say an icon is something that's similar so headphones uh, this is you know for the headphone button or for listening so it's very similar to the thing that it refers to the headphones icon refers to you know the headphone plug the pencil and um, it's an example right so if you want to write how do i write well i could use a pencil i could use a pen too or a typewriter etc but this is one thing that i could use for writing so for writing or you know editing in this case uh, the pencil is a good example the, the film reel is another example so if i want to watch a movie i could watch it on a film reel hard to imagine that people kids know what this is but maybe they do uh, this is a film reel uh, symbolic so the you know the, this music notation is it's not actual music but it's symbolic and there is a symbol that everybody knows and uh, of course nowadays now everybody knows the YouTube symbol um, so which is that one right you, you know that was the YouTube symbol that's also the play button uh, but again that's also symbolic and then there's the arbitrary one so all these new things that we have nowadays that haven't existed for a long time like Wi-Fi and people decided that for whatever reason Wi-Fi is gonna be this symbol but luckily now we all know everybody knows that this is the Wi-Fi symbol so we're all set um, so be consistent so you know when you're trying to pick a symbol and this is you know the kind of thing you're faced with many times and you say well i need a symbol for uh sending uh try to think of you know what what is similar to sending what is an example of them sending uh, is there a symbolic symbol for sending or maybe there's an arbitrary symbol for sending that we can use uh, the inverted pyramid in text and this is taught to journalist students you know when you're writing a, a piece uh, of journalism you start with a lead right so and this is also the way you should write emails uh, you start with the lead the most worthy new info should be first and up there at the top right uh, same for your programs and same for when you're delivering information to your user the most important thing should be at the top uh, and then you give more of the important details after that and then finally you give any other background info that's needed don't do the the other thing where you start with the background it's like oh remember that time you know I just, no, no no you say you know your grandpa died that's the important news uh sad news so sorry uh legibility 
you know, things should be easy to read. You need to, this is tricky nowadays because, you know, we have different kinds of screens, you know, from the small phones to the medium tablets, the large tablets, the desktop. Um, but uh, you need to, you know, make things legible. So 9 to 12 type, even larger for old folks like myself, you know, should be uh, key. Uh, the uh, serif versus sans serif doesn't matter. So, you know, some fonts can be serifed. This font you're looking here is a sans serif. That means it doesn't have serifs. Those are the little squiggly things at the end. Uh, it doesn't much matter, you know, go for the look that you like. Uh, however, offbeat fonts can be a problem. You know, it's hard like that offbeat, the double F is kind of hard to see. Uh, and then never, of course, never use Comic Sans, although I just did. Uh, contrast is much more important than your font, though, black and white or something close to it. So the, the biggest problem that people have with legibility is putting things on a background that is not the right color, that is very too close to the font color. Similarly, justified versus left aligned doesn't matter that much unless you're, you know, writing, uh, printing a book. Uh, and uh, proportional, though, it is better than monospace, even though as developers we, we get used to monospace because that's what the IDE is. You know, all IDEs use monospace for, you know, obvious reasons. Uh, but uh, proportional is just so much better uh, to read. And actually, that's not true. Some IDEs use proportional fonts nowadays because they are easier to you easier to to read um, not by default though uh, mapping so you want to have if you are dealing with a real world mapping you want to have the mapping from the real world or you know like in a game from the game world to your controller be a one-to-one -one mapping like here and so this is a classic example of a good mapping so you have four burners and four buttons, you know which button corresponds to which burner, obviously, right? However, if you put the four buttons this way, as in a real burner, it's harder. Now, yeah, so most, you know, stovetops <laughs> are actually like this or something similar like this. I know mine is um, because uh, you can't, there's no space to put the four buttons. So, yeah, reality strikes in. But in the best of all worlds, we would do something like that. Um, similarly with like joysticks, uh, you know, left, right, up, down, should be a, a direct mapping to your world. The Occam's Razor uh, tells us that given the choice between functionality, functionally equivalent designs, the simplest should be selected. Uh, so choose simple. Uh, so here, here's an example, Google versus Bing, which one's simpler? And which one did people choose mostly? Yeah, I'm not going to say, but I think you know the answer. Operand conditioning. Oh, this is evil stuff. Uh, this is an actual experiment, right? So here's a rat, and uh, he, he gets electrocuted uh, by the floor sometimes, right? So there's a little signal here that tells them, maybe tells them, uh, when he's gonna get electrocuted and then or maybe another one that tells him when he's gonna get rewarded with the little pellets, you know, and uh, so uh, You know, they did these experiments on rats. They and then it turns out that if you uh, Just add some randomness to the, the rewards or punishments uh, the, the rats become much more, you know, addictive or you know, they start pressing the lever a lot more uh, than uh, if fixed intervals or fixed ratios, right, for where they could predict. So if the rat can predict uh, when it, it's going to happen, uh, then it's uh, much less likely to be constantly pressing the button. So uh, real world examples of this in humans are include farm bill and slot machines. So they give you these things, give you sort of random rewards every now and then, and you're constantly pumping money into them, you know, just because every now and then you get a bit of money. Uh, if you got money at a fixed schedule, uh, you wouldn't be pumping so much money into this uh, machines of evil. Um, so, uh, 
performance versus preference. Uh, sometimes users prefer that which is not optimal for them. So this is many times in many applications just because people have gotten used to something, uh, even though there's something better like Dvorak. Uh, getting to that better is going to take me a lot of time, a lot of training. So I'm not going to do it. I'm going to stick with what works for me. This is very, very important when you're designing software for an enterprise that has been using, like all enterprises have been using software for long time so people in that office have gotten used to some certain way of doing things they're really not going to change at least not dramatically so don't try to make them change try to work around that uh, progressive disclosure is a cool technique where uh, you can manage if you have something very complex you can manage it by only displaying the required information so uh, the Google search box is very simple. I just type keyword there, Java. And then once I do in here, right? And then once I type Java here, search, I go to this other page where I get these tabs now. So I can now decide, oh, I want to search images or maps or whatever. So, you know, they didn't want to bother me with all that at first, but then after that, they do, they let me do that. Uh, and then you can even go under search tools and find even more, you know, uh, details about how to do more complicated searches. Um, so yeah, that's a way. That's a very good to, good way of presenting and not overwhelming your user with all the information in one screen. Just start simple and then uh, if he needs it, because you see there's some results here, maybe he's happy with this result. Uh, if he needs it, then give him more choices. Oh, or give him more choices afterwards in case he needs them. Recognition over recall. So humans uh, have a, it's much easier for us to recognize than to remember. So I can recognize a face. I can recognize a name after you tell me. Like oh yes, I remember that name. Uh, but I can't remember. You know, I can't. I cannot remember your name. I cannot remember your face at all. Uh, so so for certainly true for commands, right? So the com one of the problems with the command line is you have to remember the commands. So you can't just recognize them. And this is what makes uh, most people prefer GUIs because they can't remember the commands. They don't want to, but they can recognize, oh, yes, I see file there. I remember that. You click on file, then I do this. So when I see the icon, it's like, I don't recognize, but I remember, oh, it was this one little triangle. I got to press on that one to make the program run. So yeah, you can leverage that. Rule of thirds is uh, from photography and aesthetic rule that says that, you know, when you have one thing in a photograph, put it in this line, right? Put, put it in the, the, you have, you draw the two lines. So you have three areas and you put the guy in the line or the boat in that line. You don't put them in the middle. That is again, your tendency as a beginner, but don't do that. No, put them on the, the third. It'll look a lot better. And similarly, when you're doing your designs for web, you know, user interface, put things like that on the line, on uh, the third line. Uh, scaling fallacy that what well, works on one scale doesn't necessarily work at other scales, right? So here's a, uh, a calendar, uh, the, uh, the calendar, two scales here. You see, they're actually different. Uh, you'll see this now uh, some apps go from the phone to the desktop that the icon even though it may, might look at first to be the same icon it's not exactly the same they're actually different images so you can't just arbitrarily scale images and, and shrink them down uh, similarly with these little icons uh, I think actually these are still just shrunk down versions of um, you know this these little ones here they are shrunk down versions of the top one, but uh, eventually they'll probably change that to make these uh, like a different icon. Because uh, that will look better. Some of them are very hard. I can't tell what this one right there is at all. Um, so don't just scale things up. Uh, and finally, uh, uniform connectedness. So connected elements are perceived to be more related than the rest. Sort of obvious, but you know, so these two dots are, you know, they're related more than these two here because these are not connected to each other, even though these two here are closer to than these two here. 
Uh, certainly here, these two guys are very close, uh, more close than these two guys are to each other, but yet, you know, these guys are connected, so we know they're bros. Uh, yeah, there you go, same for these guys, and so on. In, in a GUI, we, we use these little boxes, right? So these little boxes on their uh, printer there, it's hard to see. Uh, but you, these boxes help us help the user know that these things belong together, right? These are all about the same thing. So those boxes, even though they clor clutter up your design, which is a minus, uh, they do help with, uh, for, do help the user know that these things are related to each other.